Please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Bosserman, Clinical Assistant Professor at the City of Hope Medical Group. And Dr. Bosserman is going to speak on integrating novel developments for advanced and metastatic breast cancer into improved care pathways. And this educational activity is supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca. Dr. Bosserman, welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you know, pathways and breast cancer are one of my passions. And so I agreed to do this talk um, because it's something I probably should know more about. And of course, when you write a talk, you learn more, but it's not perfected yet. But I wanted to share and really kind of build on the last lecture about the new rapid progression of developments and how they need to get incorporated into pathways, and I'll show you at the very end some tools that may get us there. So at Mid City of Hope, um, I do speak for Puma Biotechnology on neuratinib. I wrote the ed deck for it, when to use it, when not to use it. And I've done other work for AstraZeneca. It's some mostly value in pathway talks and Merck. Um, I also consult for the NCCN Academy, which has been supported both by Genentech and AstraZeneca. And otherwise, I don't own any stock in, directly in companies. It's all managed. So, so I'm hoping uh, over this time to summarize. This is what I was asked to do. Summarize the clinical and socioeconomic challenges associated with advanced and metastatic breast cancer. That, of course, could be an entire lecture, and it's actually not my area of specialty. <clears throat> to evaluate clinical and uh, public health implication of personalizing treatments according to gene mutations and molecular disease subtypes. I will touch on this and outline trial evidence for the newer therapies and options for advanced and metastatic cancer. I've tried to be fairly complete on this, and so there's, while well, every data point isn't there, really tried to summarize this, and translate this evidence uh, in advanced and metastatic disease into the treatment options, how does it impact guidelines, uh, what cost data do we have we might look at, how do we think about it versus expert opinion, and how are we gonna make this real for people? So here's my slide on clinical and socioeconomic impact. And I think they're practical common sense things that we often know. Our clinical care is still very fragmented and we certainly have big systems coming together that's helping address that. As you know, may not know, I was in private practice for 26 years in the last four years. I was practicing in a large network practice. We're now have 32 network sites with an academic center at City of Hope. And two years ago, I went to the academic center where I really work on value and implementation as well as international medicine and telemedicine and our employer strategy. Uh, so you talk about who's gonna pay for genomics, it's the employers, and that's not the topic here, but you can ask me about it later. So we don't really have good navigation. At the academic center, it's amazing the resources they have over what we had in clinical practice. <clears throat> Actually, our front staff in practice were our main navigators, unrecognized, they were great at it, because they knew the patients. Really depends where you're on the country, whether you have access to clinical trials or people that have the time and money to do a compassionate release availability of some of these targeted treatments, because that's like opening a full clinical trial these days. Um, depends on your health plan coverage or lack of it. Sometimes you're better not having coverage and being in a foundation plan. And sometimes with certain coverage, you can get access to drugs and sometimes you can't. So it's very individualized. And then health literacy. This is just something to step back that my colleagues in supportive care have been teaching me that 89% of U.S. adults have a poor health literacy. And I have an, an ill stepson at the moment who's in liver failure. And um, one of my kids, who's a college professor, very well educated, said, well, can't they put him on dialysis? And so, you know, educated people don't know the difference between the kidney and the liver, and most of them don't know where the kidneys are. So these are basic fundamental things as we think about talking to patients about molecular tests and side effects to keep in mind. Socioeconomically, there is such a huge impact in my 40 years in medicine it is so remarkable that diseases that people died of in six months were curing several of them. But what this means is chronic long-term interaction with the healthcare systems. Even in our wonderful immunotherapies, we have very significant toxicities. There's still a very new normal for our patients. We're not returning to them, even when they're cured, completely back to their healthy original self. And that's a hard reality, and it leaves impacts both on whether or not they can work, 
whether their partners can work, whether they retire early, whether they had great health benefits, whether they had good disability coverage <clears throat> during their treatment time, and the costs. What are the, do they have coverage for diagnostic testing? Do they have coverage for imaging, for therapies, whether the therapy is oral or outpatient or IV? Can really vary whether they need a lot of hospital care or not. And there's just this huge financial burden, which there's plenty written now about financial toxicity. And then certainly those of us who are in or came from community practice, our patients were in our face with cost problems, and we were the ones asked to solve it, to learn about foundations and copay assistance, and really the shocking cost of some of the things we ordered. And one of the beautiful benefits of these big community groups coming together is sharing the brilliance of some of my academic colleagues, many of whom have photographic memories, with the practical realities of everyday delivery and operations. And then there's this huge emotional burden that we're not returning patients in many circumstances to their healthy, active former self. It's a new normal. And how do we help them and their families through the burden of chronic disease, which we are grateful that we have uh, for so many more of our patients? So just the disease overview, you know, one in eight women in America get breast cancer, invasive breast cancer. A third of people with HER2 positive and even ERPR positive disease will, can have late recurrences. Heaven help you have a triple negative. It can be a higher risk of recurrence. And um, only 15% of women have a family history of breast cancer. And then overall, only 5 or 10% of all women with breast cancer have a germline genetic mutation that we can directly associate it with it. And of course, we have BRCA1-2, which has the highest chance. And then we have the intermediate risk genes like PALB2 and CHECK2 that are emerging. And we have others where it turns out they're on the list that may be increased risk for breast cancer, but they may not be that much higher than the general population. This is some work being done by my genetic colleagues at City of Hope. And then it isn't just breast cancer anymore. It isn't just hormone positive, hormone negative, HER2. There's a lot of subtypes, the luminal A. Within luminal B, there's the high KI67, the low KI67 fractions. There's the HER2 mutations I'm going to try to show you within that. There are here too, there are so many different subtypes we're learning about. Um, and then there's the basal-like triple negative. And each of those may have a different prognosis based on what therapies we have to apply to them. Uh, when we look overall, we're always grateful that uh, the majority of our patients have this estrogen positive, progesterone positive, HER2 negative phenotype, 73% overall. Um, <clears throat> we're down uh, overall at about... Um, in the, in the triple negative, about 12%, about 10% are the hormone positive, HER2 positive, and about 5% are the hormone negative, HER2 positive. This is great, except that every one of them has subcategories within them, and so we need to learn about those in order to focus our treatments. This is just SEER data from 2015 showing that people with metastatic, women with metastatic breast cancer, even in the very the, the favorable subtypes of the HER2 positive and the hormone positive HER2 negative, still you know, don't have a great uh, prognosis over the long term uh, out at five and 10 years. And those that have the triple negative do even worse. So we have a lot of challenges and a lot of reason to bring to bear all these new treatments and then figure out where they fit in. So I kind of broke the talk into these five sections, talking first about our estrogen positive, HER2 negative subtypes. And I'll cover these different topics within it. And you can have copies of all my slides that I made. Um, and then the HER2 positive subtypes, where I want to talk about some of the issues, but particularly in both the estrogen and the HER2, I want to talk about gene mutations we're learning about. We'll talk a little about HER, the triple negative and the emergence of the, um, some new, new treatments for that subtype, and the BRCA mutated, which can be in the HER2 negative or the triple negative as well, and the, the two PARP inhibitors. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we know for immunotherapy in breast cancer, and particular cellular therapies, because one of the most exciting reports has been released from that, and we're still waiting for CAR-T to figure out all the uh, targets that we might use in the solid tumors, where we certainly have had a better luck in some of the hematologic malignancies. 
So I'm not going to really review the standard chemotherapy guidelines. So you know that in, in general, they recommend single agents, particularly in the HER2 negative subtype. And the HER2 positive, the standard first line is still a dose of taxol, pertuzumab, trastuzumab, or taxol, pertuzumab, trastuzumab. Second line um, is the aldotrastuzumab um, and tansine. And then there's a bunch of single agents in combination, or we still have data down there for lapatinib and trastuzumab uh, as, as non-chemotherapy options. So those you could literally tailor to the patient, but we don't really have algorithms beyond third line of what may sequence to be the best there in the HER2 positive subsets. And the triple negatives, you know, about 50% will respond to chemotherapy, so we do it. We tend to do multi-drug chemotherapy for that subset. And even then, they might respond to third or fourth, fifth line. We don't have a way to predict that. So if I focus now on that, to starting with the subgroup data, what, what's new, what, what we pulled together, what might be helpful, I hope, is really looking at the hormone-positive HER2 negative subgroup of advanced rheumatic breast cancer. So as you know, our major treatment there, uh, assuming they don't have visceral crisis, visceral crisis, you're starting with chemotherapy. But the majority of these patients do not present with visceral crisis. They present either from a progression from an earlier stage disease over some period of time. They may or may not have finished hormonal blockade therapy within a year or longer, and we tend to subsite set those. And um, they may present with de novo disease. Uh, most will not present with visceral crisis, but certainly some will. Assuming they're not in visceral crisis, we really have had the emergence of the, CD, the, the CDK4-6 inhibitors. And I remember hearing Rich Finn's original talk as part of the UCLA network way back in the 90s about this drug category he was going to help develop from cell lines and then our first clinical trials and, and then on from there. So we have combinations of aromatase inhibitors with palbociclib, ribociclib, abemaciclib. We have tamoxifen with ribociclib and the fulvestrant with both ribociclib and abemaciclib. Um, and then we have the mTOR inhibitor that came out before that with the various aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen. Um, in the premenopausal subsets, if you're going to use the aromatase inhibitors or fulvestrins, they're recommending ovarian suppression, and I'll touch on that, uh, either with the GNRH monthly or uh, ovarian removal. And we do subset into whether you've had prior therapy, and in some studies you're going to see whether you responded or not to that therapy may make a difference in predicting. So this is my way to try to remember all these different trials. Paloma 123 is with Palbo, Mona Lisa 123, and all the way up to seven is with ribociclig, and the Monarch studies are with abamaciplic. And I try to put a little highlight, whether it was first line, phase three, whether it was after progression, uh, progression on a hormone therapy. So a little bit of an outline there of these trials that we're trying to figure out how to incorporate. So the first thing is, how, if you have a standard patient without a uh, postmenopausal woman who presents without visceral crisis, and you're looking at, I'm going to start them on a CD4-6 uh, uh, inhibitor with uh, hormonal blockade, the standards have been to use palbo or ribociclig or abamaciclig with one of those blockers. Oral therapy is going to be the cheapest, or in some cases, if they've already been progressed on an AI, you may be going to uh, um, fluvestrin. So this is my way of looking at the palbos given 125 milligrams every day, three weeks out of four. Um, you, need, you need about uh, 21 pills for a month cycle. Uh, ribos given 600 milligrams. It comes as 200 milligram pills, three pills a day, um, three weeks out of four. And then there's the abemaciclig, which is 150 milligrams twice a day, continuous. So 60 pills for a month. When you look at the progression-free survival, and until this last week at ESMO, we had progression-free survival that got the FDA approval for these. Um, you've got 25 months with the Palbo. You've got 25 months with Ribo, and I think it's 28 months or 20, in the same range, 27, 28, with the abemaciplic. I can't quite read my small writing there. Um, 
you have uh, data in premenopausal women with ribocyclic, again, in that same range, 27. And these are first-line therapies. And then when you get the use of filvestrin, you have both the palbociclig and the bemociclig that were given on progression of earlier hormonal therapy. So you've got the 9.5 months uh, with the bemociclig. And then if you look at the ribociclig with filvestrin, you're back at that 20-month range, but that was a first-line study. So effective, tolerated, common side effects that we know about, low blood counts, diarrhea, check the liver function test, fatigue, certainly risk of infection, it varies a bit um, based on the, based on the uh, medicine. Abemaciclib may have the least of the neutropenia risk, so if you're really worried about that, when we look at our VIA guidelines that I get to work with Mike Savin on, we try to put all these you know, beautiful comments in the, in the small print that I know nobody reads, but us probably. But if you're really worried about that, abemaciclib would be a choice. Otherwise, at least in the VIA network that I'm part of, we consider palbo and ribo equal. Um, ribo certainly because of the uh, prolongation of the QT interval requires EKG monitoring, so increased cost to the patient. <clears throat> so I use GoodRx. I don't know if you know that website, but we use it in practice every day to find the four um, cheapest sites where patients get their prescriptions filled and various uh, coupons that are available. And I use those four top um, uh, sites that's usually the ones you can imagine, the very large chain or the large box stores, um, to kind of get an average price for a one-month supply of drug. And so it runs, you know, 11400 for Palbo, about 12000 for Ribo, and about, again, 11405 for the Abemaciclib. So they're all in this range. Certainly if someone's health plan prefers one or the other, I, we wouldn't really argue too much about that. If you didn't tolerate one, you could try another. So... These are very expensive, but I think in our experience, when you're getting these long progression-free survivals, it may be well worth it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, um, I hope that was on my last slide. Yeah, Paloma 3. So I'm going to just mention here, at ESMO, the first data came out on improved overall survival. So we've been getting drugs approved on improved progression-free survival. But it is not true that when there's a progression-free survival that there always will be an overall survival. And sometimes that's just as important to our patients when they're trading off treatment that it may be very expensive. Should they start with just hormonal blockade and maybe that'll go a couple of years before you have to add on one of the CD4-6 drugs? These are reasonable questions that a patient might ask depending on their risk. So in the ESMO, there's about a seven month improvement in overall survival. It is not statistically significant. There is a statistically significant subset in those women who are responding to hormonal therapy that had a 10 or more month improvement in overall survival. So that data is out, published in New England Journal uh, just last week, which I'm sure you read at breakfast. Um, but the data is there. We'll be really figuring out how to pull that into our trials and Hopefully we can expect the same overall survival because we had the same range of progression-free survival in the others, but those will be coming. So comment there. So our pathway choices, you know, we have a lot with the CD4-6. mTOR, certainly we had that with, with hormonal blockade. Any of the ones you want to use are on our pathways, um, but they tend to be more toxic. And I think all of us, as we've gotten more familiar, we'll use the CD4-6 inhibitors first, CD4 uh, first, and then mTOR on progression or non-response. Um, there's really an issue of complete hormonal blockade using uh, monthly shots of GnRH in premenopausal women. We are just sending a commentary to a JCO based on the SOFT trial. The New England Journal published that in December, it really in the adjuvant setting, um, saying you could either do monthly shots of hormones with tamoxifen or exomustine, but in, I mean, or... Um, uh, aromatase inhibitor in premenopausal women, but the data is improved survival with tamoxifen and uh, hormonal blockade with GnRH. 
There are more deaths than the others, and if you look at the survival curves, they will, at eight years out, they are not going to cross for survival. And so we've sent a subset analysis to JCO, really arguing for all of us, kind of were thinking AIs were better, so we'll use AIs and hormonal blockade in our premenopausal women. The younger they are, it's just likely that they're not fully hormonally suppressed all through the month, and there may be several consequences to that. So if you're really going to have metastatic disease, and if women tolerate hormonal blockade, really think about oophorectomy because that's a much more complete way to lower the estrogen level and potentially decrease resistance to aromatase inhibitors in that premenopausal subset. Um, I'm going to talk separately about PARP inhibitors in the BRCA1 section, and I want to talk about, little to build on the last talk, the amount of estrogen mutations that we're learning. This is a website I highly recommend, My Cancer Genome. Dot com out of the Vanderbilt group. It is free, it's on the website, and they're developing an amazing set of analytics behind this, and it's fully referenced. So um, if I can use my pointer. This first over here is just, these are all, there's a list of all the mutations known in breast cancer, and all the literature is referenced here. Then they'll tell you here, for the regular estrogen receptor uh, sensitivities, everything's sensitive, as we know. Tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, um, fulvestrin. They'll let you know we didn't know yet about the PI3 kinase inhibitors, the HIDAC inhibitors. All the things that are being tested, they'll have listed as unknown yet whether it's responsive or not. And then if you click here, this is just a, this is, if you click on this particular estrogen receptor mutation, you're going to look over here, they'll show you how common every one of the subsets. This list is twice as long as what I could print. And it'll show you the commonality, 1%, 2%, 3% of all the submutations. And then there's a list of what we know about aromatase inhibitor, androgen blockade, uh, phaslid, uh, felvestrin, whether we, there's any known or unknown sensitivity. And this is for all cancers. Um, so it's an incredibly powerful website when you want to go, and it's available now, and the cost is right. Um, so that's just the amount. To incorporate that into your daily pathways is going to take high-level decision-making, and, and I'm going to show you some tools that are coming for that. So what else is on the horizon? Um, two Two, whoops, got to go back here. Seems to trying to point. Um, two drugs out of, again, out of ESMO last week. Uh, PI3 kinase uh, mutated, um, which is significant in certain subsets, particularly of uh, breast cancer. This drug, um, alpilzimib, al alpilzimib, with fulvestrant, the Solar One trial. Um, those who had progressed on one or uh, l less than or equal to one prior hormone therapies had no prior Fazlidex or an mTOR drug. They had a progression-free survival of 11 months versus 5.7 months compared to um, a dealer's choice of one to three or four chemotherapies. Median follow-up is almost two years. So again, an indicator that maybe something will be incorporated in the future, something to watch for. Uh, drugs not on the market yet. And then the HIDAC inhibitor, uh, this drug um, chitamide, phase three randomized trial using this inhibitor for those who had progressed on prior tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor. It was a two to one randomization. Examestine with or without the um, chimidamide, 30 milligrams twice a week. Uh, the SAEs are about 21%, mostly neutropenia or thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, very manageable. Progression-free survival, 7.4 versus 3.8 months for dealer's choice of chemotherapy, one of the four common single-agent chemotherapies with a significant hazard ratio. So again, something to watch for. Now let's move from the hormone-positive uh, HER2 negative to the HER2 positive categories. Some are between 15 and 20 percent of patients at diagnosis, and about 25 percent of those at progression can become HER2 positive. So we've got to keep that in mind because it's an important component of therapy uh, when that happens. That leads to the principle of rebiopsy and the importance of biomarkers. Um, 
HER2 is complex. Remember, there's a large extracellular component. That's where the trastuzumab and the pertuzumab um, meets. And then inside, there's the whole intracellular component that does the PI3 kinase, MAP kinase, and the downstream regulation that could also affect the upregulation or downregulation of the estrogen genes in those who are also hormone positive. So remember, there's HER1 through 4. In the cell surface, these are sitting as dimers, either HER1, HER1, also EGFR, most common, HER2, HER3, um, HER2, HER2, and then HER4 with others. And so Herceptin binds, or trastuzumab binds HER2. And so it, these, a lot of these TKIs that get into the cell can bind the downstream legs of uh, neratinib, HER1, 2, and uh, 4, and in the others, they, they can bind more of these to be more effective and decrease the downstream regulation, and it leads to the whole idea of combinations and when we use these. So again, the subtypes of the HER2 positivities can also have different uh, treatment recommendation, optimization. Looking at the highlights, Cleoplatra, we know, led to the docetaxel, trastuzumab, pertuzumab as our standard first-line therapy for most of these patients. Um, the AMELIA trial was the aldotrastuzumab versus capecitabine and lapatinib and showed significant uh, progression-free uh, benefits as well as overall survival benefits. And then third line and beyond, there's data, if you haven't had aldotrastuzumab, the Theresis trial uh, did better with that. And then to catnib, which my City of Hope colleagues are ecstatic about, um, they had to catnib uh, plus TDM1 uh, was presented at San Antonio um, in a phase one that was very promise, promising early results. So things to watch for that aren't ready, but the amount of drugs and subtyping in something that used to be standard when we brought these drugs to market is exploding like every other category. That would be my overall summary. Um, the TKIs, you know, yes, we have Ticurb and, and capecitabine. We shouldn't forget about two oral drugs that are fairly well tolerated. And now we have neratinib and catnib and others, several others coming in trials that get in intracellularly and can bind irreversibly and bind more of the um, her subtypes intracellularly. So the neratinib is not approved for metastatic disease yet. It is on the NCCN guidelines because of the study uh, with uh, capecitabine and neratinib that had a, an overall response rate in the brain of 49%. So these small molecules get in, but the FDA did not grant approval for it. It is on the market for early stage disease. Um, to catnib, again, with capecitabine and trastuzumab in a study, um, had a 62% overall response rate, which included 42% overall response rate in those with brain metastasis. In, in June of 17, the FDA granted this orphan status for women with brain metastasis. Um, and then there's the Herclim trial is accruing, and we're going to learn more about this drug. But I have personally seen that rare patient resurrected who had brain mets, and, you know, last eight or ten months, but it, it, these tools can be important in the right patient and the right subset. But once again, this seems like a simple story. We've got some things hanging in the cell and things hanging outside the cell we can block. But here's the story on HER2. So we have amplification, we have protein production, we have RNA, and then we have the mutations of HER2. So once again, I really uh, recommend you to this, this um, website, the mycancergenome.com. It's fully extensively referenced, anything you want to click here. But when you look at the HER2, you know, we know it can respond to the TKI um, HER2 agents, to trastuzumab and to pertuzumab and others that are in development. But those who have mutations, they're starting to fill this in, which of the many, many HER mutations may or may not be sensitive to the differing HER2-directed agents. This area is another argument that we are going to have to have technologically dri driven decision support in our fingertips in order to really optimally manage these patients because you know each of these drugs that come out are coming out in the ten to fifteen thousand dollar a month range and used well they are remarkable and not it's just a waste of time money and toxicity triple negative let's switch to triple negative disease chemotherapy is still the standard about a fifty percent overall response rate 
And then we're looking at data emerging in the PARP inhibitors for the BRCA mutated subtypes, both in the triple negative and the HER2 negative. So I'll get to that, but we are seeing a couple studies that have come out that are interesting to keep your eye on. Um, the um, androgen receptor positive, there's a significant subset, about 75 to 95 percent of women who are triple negative or androgen receptor sensitive if they're ER positive. If they're ER negative, about 50 percent will also be androgen receptor positive. A drug, um, inobasarum, as an androgen receptor blocker, has gone into trials with pembrolizumab, um, and the response rate in the aromatase, I mean, in the um, androgen receptor positive subset uh, after progression on tamoxifen was about 60%. So something to look for, not ready for prime time, but certainly if you have women in that subset, it's something uh, worth looking at for clinical trials. Um, I, I patent certainib, which is an AKT inhibitor in the LOTUS trial. It's a phase two trial in metastatic triple negative disease. Taxol with or without the um, oral um, I pat a certain in first line therapy in those with metastasis. The progression free survival was about 6.2 months versus 4.9. Um, we can be skeptical about that, but it's something to build a future regimen on that maybe work better. And there's a lot of disease. And those women who had the PI3 kinase or AKT or P10 mutation, uh, the PFS was nine months versus the five months. So more significant. And overall survival was about a five-month in month improvement. And we expect final data on this in 2019. And the last thing, a phase two trial of a whole other mechanism of an oral uh, beta-catenin um, pathway, uh, sipinoxin. Trial. So something to keep your eye on. We need more treatment of triple negative. Just know people are out there actively working on it. And if we can send our patients for trials, we can help each other. Um, in moving to the BRCA, the big uh, changes the last couple of years are the PARP inhibitors, both from the Olympiad trial of Liparib versus the choice of standard chemotherapy, in women that had germline BRCA1 or 2 mutations, progression-free survival, three-month benefit, about seven months overall versus four with the standard chemotherapy. Response was about 60% with the Oliparib versus about 29% uh, with standard chemotherapy. The serious AEs uh, are those that we, we know about, about a third of the patients, but 50% of the patients had it with chemotherapy, so there actually were less AEs in the Oliparib group. And the FDA did approve this drug for HER2 negative patients with germline BRCA1 or 2. So they can be triple negative or just HER2 negative who've progressed on prior chemotherapy. And these have to be done with an FDA approved biomarker study. So back to Dr. Hurtler's uh, talk, some of these are coming out with specific making sure that the BRCA germline you're measuring is correctly done. And same with the Embraca trial of telezoparib uh, versus choice of chemotherapy. Similar PFS benefits as to Oliparib, uh, similar response rates, much more than with standard chemotherapy in women who have the germline mutations. Serious hematologic AEs were about 55% versus 38% in chemo, so you have to watch for that here. And uh, FDA, it was... Um, the, it was FDA approved specifically for the HER2 negative germline mutated patients. Immunotherapies, I don't want to skip this, but um, checkpoint inhibitors, both pembrolizumab and atezolizumab, have some activity in breast cancer. Skipping to the atezolizumab, um, it's only approved in bladder and non small cells. So, looking at the trial results, a recent trial at ESMO with NAB, Paclitaxel, and atezolizumab, the Impassion 130 trial in triple negative first line disease, the overall response rate was 56% versus 46%. But in the PDL1 subset, it was 59% uh, versus 43%. And for those with the PDL1 positive subset, there was an overall survival benefit 25 months median versus 15. So again, sub, sub, subsetting and targeting is really what's emerging as our challenge, and we're going to need electronic tools to get there. You can keep your eye on the gelato trial, which is using carboplatinum and atezolizumab in metastatic lobular breast cancer that's ongoing. PEMBRO trials, they're all under the keynote numbers. There's a basket trial. There's a trial in the pdl one positive uh, subgroup 
uh, that has had previous chemo hormonal therapy. Um, there's the Keynote 86, which had different cohorts, which really looks at those who have untreated PDL1 first line, if you skip down to cohort B. It was really a safety trial, but they did have some increased overall response rates and duration of response. Um, something to keep your eye out on. They even had some overall survival early on, although some of these weren't powered for that. And there's other keynote trials. So we can use PEMBRO in that setting as well as um, uh, in the immunotherapy setting that we mentioned in those that have MSI high or uh, mismatch um, repair mutation where it can be used in any advanced cancer, although that's very rare in breast cancer, 1% or 2%, it is FDA approved for that indication. So there's a lot of issues with immunogenicity, immunosensitivity. So there are some studies um, looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and they're very controversial. So one set of studies basically showed that if you had low tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, meaning that you don't really have a very immunogenic setting, trastuzumab and chemo was a good thing to do. But if you had high TILs, you may not need the trastuzumab, meaning that maybe trastuzumab, one of its other major actions is to increase the immunogenicity of tu tumors. And this is just a large area of study because another FinHERS study showed the opposite. So this is something we don't have an exact um, answer on, how to put that in perspective. It's not something we're talking about or testing for right now, but it's certainly in the research area. And it's in the research area really because when you look at um, some of the most exciting work is really this study that came out from the National Cancer Institute and Steve Rosenberg in the group. They had a woman with very, very advanced multiple site in stage metastatic breast cancer having failed almost anything. And they found four very specific somatic mutations in her tumor, which are listed here, none of which I'd ever heard of. And they developed till cells against all four, grew the till cells and gave them back to her, and 22 months out, she's in a full clinical remission, maintained. So this is you know, the idea that these emerging mutations that we're testing, they're all going to come together in how we pair targeted therapies or TIL or CAR T cells toward the solid tumors. We're at the beginning of an explosion that will bring some of the most exciting treatment to patients in a way that you can get a treatment and be done. And hopefully then we can help them with the long-term side effects. As you know, with immunotherapy, six months later, you can have activation of inflammatory uh, reaction in the lungs. And so this I put in because I think it shows that our whole explosion, our ability to do uh, next-gen sequencing and proteomics and hopefully microbiome analysis soon is really where we need to go. We need to operationalize all that. You know, that's what I'm passionate about. It's, it's really we need both the operation from the administrative and the physician side. We need care model teams who can then educate patients and monitor them. We need decision support in the initial workup and technology that can empower this. Um, if we're going to get to it, there's really four components, and I'm going to skip to my last slide. We need to understand the patient, their age, their uh, geriatric features, their frailty, their comorbidities and medication. Learning from prostate cancer, if you've got a lot of comorbidities, you do not respond to androgen blockade and radiation, but if you don't, it improves your survival. That's just the beginning of what big data can tell us. So we need the patient features. We need the disease features from the beginning with the stage and the biomarkers and the sequence and their prognosis. And then we need the outcome measures and we need, need big data. And what I'm showing here is this would be a real pathway. For a patient, you would put that information in and say, for therapy ABC, what is my actual overall survival? progressions-free survival, what, is the, what are the major toxicities, what are treatable, what are permanent, what is my cost and copay, and what's the impact on care? Do I come weekly, every three weeks, am I seeing you forever so I can really work with my family and my job and my care team to understand what's right for me? And we're only going to get here 
on the verge of what we're doing. Oh, I think somebody suppressed the slide I liked. Okay, so there are companies out there doing it now. We saw a company last week that can take a PDF and pull it into the actual mutation, actionable mutations. We're looking at ways, there's a bunch of them out there. You can talk to me separately. It's about six or seven companies really being able to take the data to the bedside, and we're going to need that. Our current pathways are completely inadequate for the rapid explosion of subtyping, unless we want to just keep going on arrows. It's going to be half, like we saw it with Dr. Hurtler earlier, that we um, can have the information embedded in our electronics and in our um, paperwork and imaging come up and prompt us to the right thing. But the patient, in my experience doing a lot of managed care, when the average American makes $40,000 and has $400 in saving, and their copay on a, on a uh, cheap plan is $6,500, wants to know the impact and the cost. And they will take over and over a 1% or 2% decrease in overall survival for a hundredth time less cost, or ten times less cost, or five times less cost. And so I think we owe it to patients to use big data, not just from clinical trials where people jog to an academic center to get in a trial, to the real people that we all see every day who have comorbidities and a lot of competing interests, and give them option A, B, C, and talk to them about shared decision making with all of the impacts to matter to them, because overall survival is not the, over, the only thing they want to know and won't always choose the best one. So I hope that wasn't too much too fast. You're welcome to the slides, and there's more we could have added, but I tried to give a perspective on where this field is for all metastatic breast cancer and their subtypes and where I think we're going and what we need. Thank you.